Let me see if I can direct you again down into a mine shaft. Or you could look at it as going up toward the stars. But in a sense, trying to mine the unknown aspects and the workings of the human nervous system. And I've got a few more that people do not normally, ha ha ha, consider to look at in a particular way. And I've got a big question for you. So let's try to slide up on it sideways. I'll start off talking about something else. First, let me ask you, to what possible end does life, has life arranged things so that it stresses through man, in man, the importance of such ideas as these, that a person should say how they feel, <laughs> that people should tell the truth, to tell the truth as they know it. But you have all heard this, it's throughout history, and it feels as though it is a homing pigeon tap dancing on your nervous system when you hear it, that yes, that's true, that people should, or I should, or we all should, say what we mean. Well, then the reasonable confines of civilized behavior, I guess, and there are even those who pass for being civilized and educated who opine that there should be no restraints. Psychiatrists, psychologists, that a person should tell those part, pertinent parties how they feel. Now, no one ever questions this, other than, as I said, the areas wherein the apparent city question may come up as to how much credence, how much weight you should give to civility in the other person's feelings. But by and large, you would have to agree that the weight of evidence of the feeling of the Western world now is that for your own individual health, whoever you're addressing, that people should say what's on their mind. They should describe how they feel. That is almost now, I say the Western world, it is since all the world is becoming like us and then this part of the life's body, that it is now permeating everybody to some degree, but you're really only interested in here since none of you are moving to the wilds of New Guinea, I assume. If you are, be sure and don't write. That it is the feel that for your own best interest, you should say what's on your mind. You should say how you feel to other pertinent parties. In the health fields, there are now people who charge large sums of money, seminars, private sessions, that that is one of the offshoots, one of the parallel verbal descriptions of Western psychiatry analysis, in some way is to help you learn to do this. Think about it a second. Think about it a second. I hadn't got to the cheap laughs yet. You can, you can go ahead and laugh if you have to, but we're not to the cheap laughs yet. All right, we are. Because to me, it's always a cheap laugh that you've got to pay anybody to help you do something. See, you people just laugh at certain times when I wind it up good and twist it a certain way. But see, it's always funny to pay anybody anything. Like to have your car fixed. It's funny. Of course, that's really a cheap laugh because... That's one of the old stories I guess you got to laugh to keep from. <laughs> but anything having to do with you, other than saying your own broken leg perhaps, or taking a ward off the back of your neck, but priest, psychiatrist, to pay somebody to help you. Maybe only I enjoy it. <laughs> to what avail to what ends are things arranged this way? Now, I am aware of the fact, as I just brushed against, that at least in the western part of civilization now, it is, I guess, an accepted truism in the health field that you are better off to try and express your feelings and or express what's on your mind. That they say, contrarily, to refrain from doing so can cause ulcers, stress, untold, mental problems. Right, beyond all that, which is ordinary city operations, they're always a very pale reflection. They're always a flawed product of something greater. 
why does this seem to have any importance? Well, first, let me ask you a minor question before you slip up to the big one. I told you I had no relationship to this. Is there an operational difference between what people think and what people say? Let's simplify it for those of you who need it simplified. Is there a difference between what people think slash feel? We'll just leave it at that so we don't have to drag you into that ant hill tonight. Is there a difference between what people think slash feel and what they say? By my opening bombardment, and by what you already know, you would think at the ordinary level that yes, there is. Perhaps there would be no apparent problem about people not saying what they feel. That there can be a difference between what you think, slice feel, and what you say. Since you can't think without knowing language, let's start there. What gives? Why are things arranged so that there's a possibility, as it's perceived in the city, and heretofore all of you at line level consciousness, you would accept it too, that there is continual potential, if not activated potential, of internally you feeling and thinking one thing and saying something else. To what possible end, other than of course the insanity of being here in all this, but to what possible end could things be so arranged? Why, 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 why? And not your mother, 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 mother. <laughs> not your trauma, 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 traumas. And not curses of the God, 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 gods. No. Let's play geologist. Get down into the mind, into the actual mind shaft of human consciousness. Life is up to something. Now, the purposes that man is serving in general requires among other things, as I've pointed out quite simply, and you should simply see on the basis of what is and what is operational in life as you can perceive it now. Man needs, life needs in man, the intellect. And it's right-hand man, to use 3D picturizations, language, because you would not be able to think were it not for language, and you could not speak if you could not think. So, in a sense, your tongue is tied more closely to your brain, to certain parts of your brain, obviously, than any other part of your body. And, of course, it just so happens it's a fairly short distance, you know. From <laughs> here to right up here, it's a lot closer. Your tongue is a lot closer to your brain than it is, say, your dual denim, which I'm sure your tongue finds to be an agreeable situation. <laughs> but... To what possible end is it that something is going on up here and that something different wants to come out down here? That someone says, how do you like me so far? And you think, I don't like you at all. <laughs> then you say, not bad, not bad, I, I, I really enjoy it. <laughs> how do you like my new hairdo? It's very becoming, it's very different. Uh, do you think blah, blah, blah? Uh, yes, I do, yes, I do. And there is, as I said, in the human nervous system, and very blatantly, right at just below the surface, just go down the mind a little bit, just enough to where it starts getting dark, and you realize that it is already wired into your nervous system to accept the reality that there is a difficulty, there is a gap, there is a problem of some great significance between what somebody says and then what they internally think or feel. So I don't have to keep saying think slash feel. You got to remember what you think and what you say is ultimately being fueled in part by the fumes <laughs> lower down the mind, human emotion. So let me, I said simplify, but let me just say a difference between what you think and what you feel, because all of it has a similar source eventually go down far enough. But why is it intelligent, reasonable people? And we're, again, I'm not talking about the edges of civility that simply somebody if something means no consequence to you that your girlfriend or your boyfriend says how do you like my new shirt or my new hairdo and you don't really care one way or the other and you can tell that they're proud of it and you say well you know, do you like it or if you already know you don't have to play verbal games you say I like it I like it we're not talking about that 
and Western Sacro Bible. An analysis would probably say, well, you got to have area, some area that you can assuage one another under social conditions wherein it has no great importance one way or the other. But we're talking about the kinds of things that put people in mental hospitals, would say city psychiatry and other institutions, that you cannot hold back certain things on the basis of being civil. You've got to find let your feelings out. And of course, and I say of course, I guess some of you know as well as I do, in the last few years, in the United States there's even been books by people with a license from some state, I assume California, to practice some form of psycho stuff that even says that relationships, like sexual, love relationships, that strong argument, maybe just this side of this, could be good for relationship. I forgot the title of the book, it's something like, you know, love through assault and battery. <laughs> the point being that they say that not only is there nothing untoward about lovers and family members arguing, it's probably good for the relationship. Now in the city, that's neither here nor there. As you know, I'm not here to deal with that. It just is. Whatever is contemporarily popular in the city now is contemporarily popular in the city now. But what is it if you start getting down to play geologist into the nervous system and the way it may be tied up with life and what's flowing through man, what possible reason could it be that everybody responds to this and believes it to be true and believes that there's some importance lurking herein that you think one thing and you say something else continually and it's such a problem that people pay hundreds of dollars an hour for someone to talk to them about it. People read books about it. Think about it a second. Now, you already knew this, so don't just dismiss it like, well, it's part of the uh, pressures of modern day life. <laughs> Think about it. This, again, it's a funny one. Most people don't understand that geology is funny. <laughs> it's hilarious. Of course, you get the, and they used to your pants torn out and you get mud all over you, but it is a funny discipline, real funny. Being a miner is funny. If you know how to do it. <laughs> Let me move a little further away from the thing that I told you name connected with this. <laughs> Consider this. People are wired up immediately to take responsibility for what they say. Now, under ordinary, middle class, city conditions, we're not talking about somebody that said they were drunk. Ordinarily, people must take responsibility for what they say. They can go back and play the good city games. There's a great city one, a one-two punch, one of the great ones. I was, should save this for a whole evening, but a great unrecognized city punch is, first off you say, that's not what I said. <laughs> then the reporters play you back a videotape that they say, sir, why did you say that you were adamantly opposed to the SDI defense appropriations? The man says, I did not say that. And they say, wait a minute, and they play it back, and there he stands in the well of the House of Congress, and he says, I am adamantly opposed <laughs> to spending any money from the SDI. And of course, it doesn't phase him. He says, ah, and here comes the number two punch. And he says, that's not what I said, and they play it back, and he goes, ah. He said, ah, but that's not what I meant. <laughs> but still, the point being, the point being that the man, everybody, you are stuck with what you said. Whether they got on videotape or not, very likely you may remember it. But at first, somebody may say, well, you said so-and-so to me last week. You promised you'd do so-and-so. And you might just immediately say, no, I didn't. And the person say, you know, we're talking about a dance. It's not a battle between you and the person. But now you should know life is just moving in a certain way right then. A very small way, almost of no significance. But between you and this person, you say, I didn't say that. Another person says, yeah, you did. You said right here and you told me 7.30 and suddenly you're dancing backwards. That is what the other person accused you of is going to prevail right then. They're going to lead that step and so there you're stuck. Now notice, then you will take responsibility. That is, you do not deny you said it anymore. But you don't say, wait a minute, I don't even know you. You know, you don't do all that. You finally to the point somebody says, you said so and so. You're like the little scene I just made up of the politician that says, I did not say that. 
and they showed them videotape or the person that you're talking to and dancing with suddenly without a videotape gives you a, almost a dip gives a good step and you realize, you don't know why you do it but suddenly you quit denying that you said it then you have to fall into well that's not what I meant or then you have to shift the blame the point is I ju just need you to see this one thing people will take responsibility for what they said now in the full range when I say responsibility they can get now I didn't mean it and you misinterpret it but what I mean is if somebody says you said these words you said I will do so and so people say alright I said it then you got a comma because I always got the way to say well I didn't mean that but they will say alright I said it now follow me for a second it is a form of them expressing the collective belief and individually a free will they reserve the right to put a comma and say no, I, but you misunderstood me or something happened in the interim but they will go ahead and they will take human responsibility that alright I said that but now, nobody will take responsibility for I thought that. <laughs> no. It never even comes up. It's not even a discussion. No reporter, no psychiatrist, no philosopher has ever given this to another human. Nobody has ever asked a human to be responsible for what they thought. Because on the surface of it, that is ridiculous. If not blasphemous, because I, right, I may be responsible for what I say. But now we may be getting close now that you bring it up. That original question of why there seems to be a difference between what people say and what people think. You may have given it away. See, I'm talking now for the city about me. You follow me, don't you? Now you may have given it away because now I see perhaps why life is arranged this way. It's because of the fact, you hit it, it's because of the fact that we are not responsible in some curious way, but some obvious way, we're not responsible for what we think. God knows, I mean, I'd be embarrassed if people knew what I think. <laughs> I'm sure the Pope would. I bet my mother, I hate to say it, but I bet my dear mother has thought things I wouldn't want to hear about. But we all know without saying it that we're not responsible for what we think. We're responsible for what we say. Ha, huh. you about explained it, <laughs> says the city to me. And of course the city is always, I say, <laughs> so notice the picture that I'm trying to present to you are the seismographical picture since we're down underground that all life is arranged that is all people are arranged to believe that there is a distinct continual possibility of there being a difference between what anybody you anybody else is thinking and then what they say and coevally, life has continually put through this message through man that this is not an agreeable situation, that we in some way within these certain civilized confines, but in general, we should be able to learn to develop or just be able to say what it is we're thinking, that it's important, very important, very important, not just psychologically, religions have said it. Put that together with the fact that in these two areas of there seems to be a distinct difference. Remember how I started off between what a person says, their speech, and their thoughts, that they may not match. That apparently the thought processes between two people are going the same way. The person says, let's discuss our relationship. And you say, okay, we are. Then you would assume they're both thinking about it. And the person says, I don't think you love me as much as you used to. So getting down to serious, you assume both partners, there they are, and they're dancing, that they're both thinking in the same areas. And the person says, yes, I do. And then psychologists, film directors, run of the mill critics of life from your own experience. You get away from it, or you're outside, and you look at somebody else's dance, and you think, or maybe it appears to be proven to you at some later date, a second later, an hour later, that one of those parties, at least, was not telling the truth when they said, yes, I love you as much as I ever did. Look what they did an hour later. They were not telling the truth. That is, they did not speak the same thing that they thought. So this could have dire consequences, unprofitable ultimate effects on people's relationship. Now put that together with the fact that ordinarily you should have followed now what I was trying to point out when I said people are responsible. People 
will take responsibility that yes I said so and so they don't put it in those necessary words to tie it with free will but what they're saying is I humanity that in some way we are all we've got to be we're responsible for what we say and nobody's ever put it to them this way I repeat but then if I did and I said all right then you're also responsible for what you think oh no heavens no we all know that I didn't decide to think about strangling my mother I didn't decide one day I believe I'll start having daydreams about having sex uh, with a hockey team or with a note tree no, I didn't ever think that it disturbs me I should but I did not decide to do that so it's like we tacitly in the city everyone gives everybody else I repeat one more time I don't let this slip by you nobody's ever discussed this you may think you've heard something similar but people have never discussed this it does not arise but if it did people would say to one another all right all of us just human nervous systems would know that I'm not responsible for everything I think to say the least therefore other people are not now that kind of apparent quote logic does not prevail all the time but I'm saying if the subject arose if I could see get a large number of ordinary people to consider this matter to hear it then they would verbally agree that all right I'm not responsible for what I think I can't be because too much of what I think I don't like too much of what I think I disapprove of too much of what I think I heartily disapprove of I've paid money I've taken drugs and alcohol to try and stop thinking some of these things so I'm not responsible I'll tell you that now I'll admit to you out front I think some horrible things I'd never tell you horrible things and I'll bet you're the same way and other people go yeah <laughs> so are you following all this this mathematical geological excursion all that together now you've got apparently two positions of humans regarding what people say and what people think and one of them they take responsibility for without knowing it and they don't discuss it that is what you say now you may have horrible thoughts but by God you can keep your damn mouth shut you don't have to tell me about it you don't have to tell other people you don't have to walk up to strangers when they're eating and say sometimes I feel like that I want to it scares me and I feel like I'm going to run down the street naked and throw up and you don't have to say that to, to a stranger sitting at a lunch counter and when you go home for the holidays you don't have to walk up to your mother and say did you know I still have these dreams almost daily about strangling you <laughs> ordinary people say you're right and what they're saying is I am not responsible what they're saying without knowing it if they were to say it is I have no idea where this kind of internal noise these molecules that make noise in my own head and I have a noisemaker in here and I have ears that can hear the noise in here but that part I'm not responsible for but in some way we've all got to be responsible for what we say all right, put all that together think about all that for a second what is going on that life makes everyone say that what you say should matter what you think simultaneously makes people believe that one of them that is what you say you're responsible for and what you think you're not on that basis why in the world would life expect people to put them together they're not together one of them's out of your control one of them's under your control why should they reflect one another what could be the possible connection between the two if what you think came from God knows where <laughs> unconscious forces forgotten traumas evil spirits ill humors that affect the body wherever they came from their own known how in the world could life expect you to take something total out of your control the source of which is unknown and make you put that together with something you're responsible for think about it a second now life's asked some ridiculous things to you <laughs> well, most of them you don't even know about I just start hinting about but life has asked some ridiculous things but think about that why would life do that to what possible end there is an end to it of course I'm not here to point out the follies of life contraire <laughs> <laughs> if anything is going on life is here to point out the folly of there's people in the city that believe they're there to point out the folly of life out in the bushes we know better 
out in the bushes we play like we know better at least because if life begins to suspect that you know better it expects you to act like you know better <laughs> that's why I'm not telling you except you people that's why Larry personally gets a card from me on every birthday <laughs> just in case just in case <laughs> All right. Why not? Okay. For the night, the big Q, the big question. This is one of the ones I like. I hate to give a preface, but I normally do, don't I? Because this can't be explained, and yet some of you are going to think you hear it immediately. We're down into a new strata of the mind now. Let me ask them. I'll put it as the big question since I said that. We'll call it a question. Would religions, all mental disciplines, psychiatry, psychology, sociology, all forms of apparent human analysis would they all be a total waste of time on those who couldn't talk? At least based upon the reaction I'm getting here and the ones I feel on tape, at least the first one I've little caveat I gave about, well, it may sound too direct, evidently. That wasn't the problem, was it? All right. Here we go. I'll make it. It'll sound simple in a minute, and it may be like a train going by you, except that near the speed of light, and you won't even know it. And you'll think, oh, that. And then it's gone, and you already missed it. So here it goes. We're not, we're way below and above any horizontal criticism of these institutions and hobbies of the city of psychiatry and religion, etc. It's not that. But now, all of these things that I mentioned, any more that I may think about or that you've thought about, things that apparently are for the benefit of humans to make it where they could live a better life, a fuller life, a happier life, do whatever it is that people in the city suspect they may be supposedly doing. All those things, religions, philosophies, all forms of human analysis, the study of human behavior, the human potential movements, anything that you can put in that spectrum. No attack yet on no criticism, that they've got to serve some purpose, that people say that they do help. But let me ask you, could any of those things help? The presence of the Pope himself to a Catholic if we could dig and revive up Jung or Freud, for those that like psychiatry better, if you presented them with a person who couldn't talk, would all of the arts and sciences of their knowledge and their study, would it amount to anything? Would it be a total waste of time on someone who couldn't talk? Evidently, I still haven't made it simple enough, have I? Well, first off, human consciousness. I can always speak for human consciousness. <laughs> That's no problem whatsoever. <laughs> human consciousness would say, well, if I'm hearing what you're saying, the reason you're not getting much reaction is it's dumb. Because whether a person could talk or not wouldn't have any effect. <laughs> really? Really, really, really. We had a person, and we're going to give them the benefit of the best knowledge of our day from its best practitioner, or whatever methods they were using of a religious nature, a schematic nature, a psychological nature, a healing nature, laying hands on them, praying for them, chanting to them, giving them 
new translations from the Upanishads, give them the latest ideas in California psychiatry, anything, and you've got a person there that can't talk, would it help them? And city consciousness would go, I, I hear you. You've said that two or three times. What the hell difference does it make whether they can talk or not? If it could help somebody, it would help them. Okay, how would you know? Uh, I'm back to city, playing city conscious now. Well, well, wait a minute. Well, now, if somebody couldn't talk and they broke their leg and uh, somebody set their leg for them, they wouldn't have to say, I mean, we could see that later that their leg healed up in a nice straight way and they can still walk, but that's not what I said. In the ways that are strictly human, the ways that are singularly human, apparently to heal, to help, to expand on the human spirit, the human mind, would any discipline, any art, any so-called science, all the way from psychiatry to religion, would it be an absolute waste of time on somebody who couldn't talk? Okay, says city consciousness. All right, if you're going to narrow it down like that. Uh, I still don't see the connection. What would that have to do with it? I say it would not, then. I won't ask you the question. I say it would not. And city consciousness says, well, that's dumb, too. That makes no sense. So I ask you again what most of you either didn't hear or you heard it too well. We're not talking about an observable broken leg. The Pope, the world's greatest Indian healer, Freud's great-great-granddaughter, applies all of their talent, all of their art, all of their knowledge on this person. How would we know if they were helped or not? Can the mute be helped? A crescendo. Do the mute need to be helped. I'm not sure I have to I'm not sure I have to keep going back playing this city consciousness. Most of you are playing it for me tonight of going All right. You know me, I'll get down the dirt, I'll make it even simpler. Whatever you imagine today, or that in some time past, whatever you would imagine would be somebody, not a doctor to heal a broken leg, to patch it up, but somebody, whether you looked at him as being a would-be guru, a past holy man, a prophet, Freud himself, whoever, that in some way, by all your imagination, all you read, all you imagine that should be, that there would be a kind of person, historical, let's say, somebody that you dream that could take another human, a human that looks poor in spirit, well, just an average human that you would assume is about like an average human, kind of poor in spirit, confused the mind at times, just an average run of the mill person, and you could bring back, and you got this person, we'll say, well, we better not say you. Let me keep it simple enough. You take this person that we're assuming has the run of the mill problems that all people in the city have, the doubts, the fears, the little hurts, the bruises in their spirit, in their mind, in their soul, in their emotions, whatever you want to call it. And now you've got this figure that to you in some way could instigate, if not persevere all the way to the end with some sort of healing process. Not the saying of a broken leg, but just what people in the city nowadays call a healing process to strengthen the person's soul, to try and soothe over some of the many, which I'm sure we all have, psychological, subconscious traumas. All right, and this person that you imagine could do it, they come and they do it all. Give them all the time they want. Let them do anything they want to, and then thank them. If the person could not talk, how would you know if they were helped? And I said I was going to make it really dirt simple, didn't I? <laughs> How would you know that they were helped? And city consciousness can say, well, that's just super dumb, and don't ask me again. 
<laughs> I'm going to ask you again, how would you know if there were health? Well, all right, city, you can say things like, well, you'll just know. <laughs> now, you know we're beyond that level. All right, you can say things like, well, all right, the person was either helped or not helped. If you think that's a sophisticated step up from the other one, you're wrong. <laughs> how would you know that somebody was helped? They can't talk. <laughs> now, I mean this in the full sense of the word. They're not going to respond. When I say they can't talk, they're not dealing in language. It's not that you can say, were well, you helped? And they go, you know, point, I can't talk. And then they go, I don't mean that. When I say they can't talk, they are not dealing with language. They're not dealing with speech. I didn't cut out thought. I didn't say they couldn't think now. And I told you this wasn't connected to where I started. <laughs> thought and speech. I didn't say they couldn't think. I didn't say they couldn't feel. I didn't say anything. I said they couldn't speak. But I mean they're not dealing with the whole area of speech. That you can't ask them something like you can't speak and them go, well did Freud help you when he talked to you all night? They're not dealing with language. They are m mute, period. How would you know that they were ever helped or not helped? All right, I'll answer for you. There's no way in the 3D world that you would ever know. How would you know? There is no way. So now back to my parallel questions to the big question as to whether that'd be a waste of time. The questions, do those not dealing with language, full mutes, can they be helped? Secondly, could a full non-language person, is it possible they would even need to be helped? <laughs> That's not silly. It's not even silly in the rest of it because how would you know they need to be helped if they're not dealing with language? <laughs> There's no way physically that they could ask for spiritual guidance. There's no way physically that they could pantomime the desire for psychoanalysis. <laughs> How would you know that a totally non-language person needed any help? Now, they might show, they could show it their leg. You know, that evidently they fell in his blood and their, their knee bends this way and back the other way. <laughs> or they might show that my ear is off and it's bleeding. But how would any person show that they needed mortal help, spiritual help, psychological help. They could not. But then city consciousness might say, all right, if I'm going to follow that line, that's not the same as you asking that kind of rhetorical question. Is it possible that the truly mute don't even need help? There's a difference between not needing help and not being able to say you need help. Yeah? What the hell is it? What difference is it? And city consciousness says, that's not possible. Not possible. If the yellow circuit ran anywhere close to what they think should be logical thinking, which is not the point, but if it just got close, they would have to go, Jesus, that's unbelievably weird, but that's true. That if you couldn't say you needed help, you wouldn't need help. And it's, it's as though life has its own, what do you call it, unconscious and things are wired up in such a way that if too many people hear such as that it's like life like knowing what it's doing it's like you being able to talk and maybe play the piano at the same time and plus turn around and scratch yourself where it's itching that, that's life turning around to people and it does this little thing all the little gangula down the nervous system that turns into men it's like grabbing too many heads that might have heard something like that and they go boom <laughs> it's like I didn't hear that or if I heard that <laughs> it makes no sense it's dumb <laughs> We've got to turn the tape over. Well, I guess I've pirouetted around enough for you tonight on this. So let me, I gave you, try to give you breathing room. Ways for you to maneuver yourself around and try to get some sight of your own. So instead of the rhetorical questions and what if and what else, let me point out directly now, some of you have already got glimpses of it, the very things that seem to be uniquely human, 
no need for me to try and detail them or catalog them completely, even if I could. Whatever you feel, just at the 3D level, what separates man? What your nervous system tells you, what your mother told you, what your culture and religion apparently told you, whatever. It's all inclusive. I don't care. What seems to be unique with man on this planet that separates you from a dog, a chimpanzee, all the things that you're, are uniquely man, not your skeletal structure, not muscles, not sinew, not blood, not hair, not bone, the things that separate man from the higher primates, from anybody, the things that seem to be normally as they're called of the spirit, of the mind, all of those things without which you would not be a fully functioning human. All right. All of those things apparently have, external to man, these institutions that life provides, the religions, the philosophies, psychiatry, and the intent from all 3D observation, they just is, the intent is to minister in the full sense of the word, not religiously, but is to minister, to feed, to connect to these internal singularities of man's spirit, his mind, his soul, whatever. None of these can be ministered unto to a non-language person. Do you not see, and this is not, this is not a point I'm making, this is still to what end, but I'm just going to point to it real direct instead of dancing around. Do you see that none of the institutions, none, and this is not simplistic, this is complex as hell, but you're going to hear what I say, it's just not simplistic. None of them, from religions all the way to psychiatry. Let's consider that that about covers this full gamut right now. None of those could minister to man if the man doesn't talk. That is the recipient. But the apparent source, the institutions themselves must do what? Talk. You cannot have a religion without language. You cannot have psychiatry without language. You can't pass along family wisdom. You can't pass along the cultural mores. You cannot swap common wisdom between you and your friends without speech. I didn't say without thought, without speech. If you had someone, we're still talking about, remember, speech and thought. We got somebody, I hadn't said a word about thought. Let's assume that their thoughts are like everybody else's, just as good. But the second part, speech, is just non-existence. They do not deal in language, all right? How could you ever minister unto the person? that the Pope, or as they believe in the city, God himself, or at least his brother-in-law, comes down and says, I'm here to help you. And the man does not deal in language. What could God himself do? But the second part is, not only could the question, as I put it, could they be ministered to? Could they be helped? The second part, the better part, the crescendo, if you're a John Philip Sousa fan, is would such a person even need to be ministered unto? And of course, if you're still trailing back at the city level of listening to this, an answer to you, to any possible city level answer to those, is how would you know? No matter what you answer, how would you know? And there is even a third one that I was not prepared to really go into tonight. If there's no way to know, then what does that do to your question? Even for you to speculate. If there is no way to ever know, what does that do to any question? Now, does anybody see any possible connection? Any parallel? Between all of this and... No, I surely you wouldn't. I shouldn't even ask. <laughs> a 
But how about for those who have good short-term memories to go all the way from the, from the fact that life makes everyone believe that there is two distinct areas of thoughts and speech and that they do not necessarily parallel one another at any given time and people are wired up to believe that they should more closely track one another that one should be the same as the other a reflection one of the other then the question all right everybody's made to believe that and feel that and then everybody's made to not do it so you're right off you got the tweet question again as to what and why things seem to be arranged like all right all you people go there and stand and all humanity goes over there and stand and then life says but don't get the ground dirty and you, you know, you, what are you going to do with this? <laughs> so you got that. <laughs> then you got the fact of these two, without men having a direct knowledge or ability to analyze it, they believe that one of these has some relationship to free will, individual responsibility, and that the other one is just out of control. <laughs> or at the very least, out of my hands. <laughs> but are any of you following even this kind of sequence of believing with no alternative. You're just wired up to accept that there are two different things. There's speech and there's thought. And that they do not necessarily parallel or reflect one another. Of course, speech being, what seems to be important is that man's speech does not necessarily reflect what he's thinking, and it should. And yet things are wired up to where everybody does not. And yet between the two, you've also got this apparent additional problem that one of them seems to be under some control and that people do have to take responsibility, and no one seems to be nobody's responsibility, how are you going to put all this together? <laughs> and then for me to bring in the big question, how can you minister unto somebody? How could you try and heal whatever, say, this particular rift that seems to be in the human psyche? How could you begin to minister into this to help somebody if an individual somewhere, that this part was just non-existent? not just on their part, they were not languaged. That they did not respond to language. They didn't, ship, they didn't tell you whether they could hear or not hear. How could you then help the person in this problem? Then my question was, would such a person, are you sure, would such a person even have a problem? <laughs> I'm pointing out, I assume a few of you a couple of minutes ago heard this, no religion no religion of any kind could apparently help anybody if the religion never said anything. Am I right? <laughs> now, is that not obvious? If it didn't say anything, that you just turn the corner one day and there in the middle of Bucharest was the most astounding, obviously, spiritual structure. You couldn't identify it with any particular religion or denomination, but just obviously a spiritual structure. You'd know in some way and nobody knew anything about it because the only people you saw fooling around there, they never said anything. Now, I mean, when I say they're the non-language people, that you ask them, do you work here at this place? And perhaps they smiled and went on. That nobody seemed to deal in language. That would not be, in fact, it would not even be reality in the city because you understand such as this couldn't happen. I can say it did. And it sounds physically that that's possible that suddenly of course, then you're falling into my old story of the project. But you believe. It sounds, it sounds physically possible to suddenly or to end up in a city, in a sea of place that you have no doubt. Maybe somebody's with you. And both of you have no doubt. That is a spiritual structure. There's no doubt. And yet you can't find anything about it because nobody's ever heard a word said about it. Now, that sounds like that's possible. But you do know that's not possible. 
That might be fodder for a twilight zone if Rod Serling was still alive. But that kind of thing can't happen out in the world. Life is not wired up that way. So you could not have a religion. You could not have a school of psychiatry, or psychiatric philosophy or thought without the institution, that is the apparent something out here talking. Now, looked at not from that, from out there, but in, internally to the individual, if you did not deal in language, if you were this structure that language was not a part thereof, would you ever need to be ministered unto? Would you ever need any help? And you might say, well, yeah. Now I'd ask you, well, how would you know you needed help? <laughs> oh, all right, I'll point out, you only need help if you know you need help. No, I shouldn't even get close to not telling you the truth, should I? If there's one person that you should be able to realize that their speech matches what they know, of course, there's several areas that I've obviously admitted to everybody that I've got to lie to you about. That is, I can't tell you everything I know. And I can't tell you where I came from. <laughs> but let me tell it better. <laughs> A person wouldn't need any help if they couldn't say they needed any help. There, that's better. I feel better I got that off my chest. <laughs> So, see, I was about to kind of hold back on you there, but you knew I'd give in, and but I thought maybe the first one is throwing inside jokes that sometimes I'll do a piece of it because some of you then I'll see a short circuit that you'll jump and you'll get to it on your own, which is even better. It's still true. I just expanded it to say that those, a man would not need help if he didn't know he needed help. That's true enough, but it's better. It unfolds it. To point out that a person would not need help if they couldn't say they needed help. No? <laughs> Think about it. And city consciousness, if it's hearing any of this, again would say, that is extremely, extremely dumb. <laughs> You'd probably say it's not even untrue, it's not even ridiculous. He'd just say, well, that's just dumb. That's, that's the worst I can do. I could say fucking dumb, but it's dumb. Is it? How could you be helped? Let's assume you need help, and you're non-languaged. You need help. How could you ever seek help if you couldn't say you needed help? In those singular human areas. You couldn't. Think about it. That's enough. You couldn't. Now the question is, all right, if you couldn't say you needed help, would you need help? Now he answered it. I'm saying you know. And city consciousness goes, you know, this is getting dumber and dumber. <laughs> on what basis, sir? Well, it, it, on, the basis that, <laughs> on the basis that it can't be true. Well, why? It just can't. <laughs> well, you got me there. All right. Should I go any further with this? <laughs> Should I have to repoint out examples I have over and over that many of you hear now and then, that many of you already believe that you've absorbed some of what you assume is one of my major attempted impacts on you of cutting down on a whole lot of useless talk? What if just about all talk is useless for the revolutionary purpose? Or if not useless, let's turn it around the other way. What if all the things that you find to be your soft spots, your bruises, your problems, that even now some of you are to the point, I won't give you a whole lot of credit, but I won't take away any credit, but that some of you are at the point that you at least hesitate more than you did about talking about problems. But you're not fully satisfied, of course, because consciousness says, all right, I don't talk about my problems as much as I used to, at least around here, and at least to him I don't anymore. But Jesus, that didn't make him go away. Really? <laughs> well, I, that could be, but I'm going to have to tell you this.
that you know you can say, well, I don't talk about him as much anymore, and it's probably the way you laugh at it and I, you've made fun of it. But just not talking about the things, I guess maybe I feel a little bit better sometimes, but it doesn't make them go away. I mean, the problems are still there, and so to that I say, shit, you didn't do it correctly. <laughs> If you totally non-languaged your so-called problems, I don't care what they are, this side of a broken leg, if you non-languaged them, there's nothing else to say. <laughs> not only do you not have a problem, you don't need help. You can't need help, or you would ask for it. And if you can't ask for it, you don't need help. I can keep along certain lines similar to what I'm doing and as many times I <coughs> feel inclined to offer the caveats to newer people that it just begins to sound almost in some form of a unknown macho fascism which you know, because there's no city descriptions for this to say all right chin up you know, be a sturdy old stick. Don't whine. Don't cry. Don't let people know you're having problems. And there are people in the city that I could step out and say, I got a brand new philosophy. I got a brand new book to sell, and it's chin up, old stick. <laughs> and there'd be, and there are people in the city. They go, Yeah, you're right. And I could say, Just notice all your heroes in the movies, in literature, throughout history. It's always been strong, silent types. People go, Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's not it. It is a reflection of something. But see, people in the city can't simply do it. That is, ordinary consciousness cannot simply do it. And if you can't simply do it, you're doomed to what? I told you that Monday night. To talk about it for how long? Ever. <laughs> that those contrarily that can simply do it don't have to talk about it. If you can simply stop drinking, stop smoking, stop overeating, if you can simply do it, you don't talk about it. Not because I said you don't. Not because you decided, well, I won't talk about it and make me look better. It's none of that. You have non-languaged it. You have taken it out of the hands of ordinary consciousness. You do not, when I say you don't have to talk about it, it's you don't talk about it. But if I start saying that, that's a good place for city consciousness. But those contrarily that can simply do it don't have to talk about it. If you can simply stop drinking, stop smoking, stop overeating, if you can simply do it, you don't talk about it. Not because I said you don't. Not because you decided, well, I won't talk about it and make me look better. It's none of that. You have non-languaged it. You have taken it out of the hands of ordinary consciousness. You do not, when I say you don't have to talk about it, it's you don't talk about it. But if I start saying that, that's a good place for city consciousness to jump in again and say, well, that's dumb. That's not just wrong. It's just it's wrong and dumb. <laughs> All right, let me see if I can slip this in on you. Repeating again, does everybody, you, you're inclined to forget this, some of you newer people, whoever newer people are. I'll leave it to you, you can classify yourself. <laughs> that, no, that no matter how often I warn this, ordinary consciousness, even if it begins to get intrigued with some of this in a passing manner on some night when I'm talking, it's still... When you when you listen to it at the ordinary level, to what degree you are, and all of you are having to hear it to some degree from the ordinary view, from the ordinary level, no matter what I say, you still take all of this, no matter what I say, God, I've got to repeat it, no matter what I say, you still hear part of it as a critique of man, that this is something wrong, all these things, all I draw about, and all my gestures, and all my talking, is in some way, even though I say it's not, that it's still a critique of man because that level of consciousness that hears it Here's it as a critique. It has no choice because at that level it is a critique. Although that's not what I'm talking about. To it, it is a critique. To the degree they can hear some of this, it's, oh my God, that is true. Oh shit. God, I, I never realized it in that manner. I'm worse off than I thought, etc. All of this that some of you begin to hear about a little bit, 
of a nonverbal place, a place not caught in this dichotomy. It is a place that is outside of my descriptions of the nervous system, my drawings. It is an area above, outside the normal limits of where consciousness is now, where life produces it in everybody. Remember my old level of consciousness there in the brain itself. Up here, when that thing begins to operate, is the place. This is not magic, and it's not going back and patching this up because this is not cracked and it's not broken. But it's up here. The son of a bitch don't talk. That's the technical description. <laughs> All right, I'll be more truthful. It does communicate, but it does not talk to people. None, nobody has ever done it. It simply does not talk because it did not grow up in the same place. It's not simply that human language is a second language. It's just a language that it doesn't engage in. Any of you who really want to take a short flight of fancy, you might remember those poor souls that's had flashes of this throughout history, normally referred to as mystics and etc., that had flashes of this and then fell back to earth or then got shot back up out of the mine and found themselves back at home in the city, they try to talk about it, and what do they say? One of the, besides saying, hey, something happened to me and it's the greatest thing in the world, but I can't tell you exactly what. Besides that, they all say that. What's the other thing that they always say? All of them. Throughout all cultures, all histories, is they say, I reached a place, it was like, you know, for those few hours, those few minutes, whenever it was, through whatever happened to me, through drugs, starvation, some cosmic accident, I suddenly looked out and I saw life Compared to how we see it, I saw life as a whole new ball game. And what's weird, I saw it and I didn't think about it. And that's why they say, when they try to do it in a kind of a yellow circuit manner, they say, I guess that's why I can't come back and I can't tell you people now what happened because it was like my mind went blank. I was conscious. But it was like I was looking and I wasn't thinking. I wasn't tied into the same old mindset, the same old speech patterns. And then some of them even begin to say, I'm not sure, but I seem to have a recollection that I realized at that moment that language in some way ties up our perceptions of reality. That almost sounds, uh, I don't know, that almost sounds like something, but I don't know what it means. What they were experiencing was consciousness without the dichotomy of thought and speech. Because you can be conscious, and up there, the, using my prevailing diagrams of this, of me saying that truly what is happening, what's always happened, is the human nervous system parts that are not in operation now. Simplistically, parts of the brain that's not operating, it's not necessary to operate, is this kind of activity, whatever the hell this is, throughout history, it's got a few people operating inside their nervous system beyond the point that was necessary for human existence here for four score and whatever it is. But that part was not raised in the city, it is not part of the same genetic line that is the middle class, that is all of us to begin with, it knows language. It knows what you're talking about. It knows what everybody's talking about. It's been there. But it, it does not speak the human language. I'm not saying it couldn't, but that is not the coin of its realm. And if it has any problems, I'm not saying it does, but if it has any problems, it couldn't tell anybody. <laughs> what if this gets to be the dominating dance partner in your step? And it knows down here that this thing can talk all it wants to. It can talk, and here's the part that sees down and sees what's going on. This thing can talk, and it takes no effort. It never took any effort. It moves, and it takes no effort. It breathes, and it takes no effort. And it cannot call out for help unless it can call out for help. And if you stop it from calling out the help, miracle upon miracle from this other position, not at city level, because city level, they can't even try it. And if they even hear it, they go, dumb, extremely <laughs> dumb. From the other level, you realize why I have talked so long and sound like at times I was attacking speech. Seemed to be holding up some sort of vexillium, praising, silence, suffering through with a stiff upper lip, etc. <laughs> and it's not that. It is simply that you cannot ask for help if you can't ask for help. You don't need help if you can't ask for help. And of course, you do all that, then you realize this real, the real pickle in this whole sandwich is you realize, hell, I don't need no help. 
what a I guess I better write this out for you people taking notes but you finally see that and you it's just you know it's what a fucking shock <laughs> let me really change the subject how far am I behind tonight how long have I been talking an hour 59 minutes behind can a person and we'll start off just an ordinary person and then we'll talk about unordinary people like all of you aspire to be can a person discover in the full sense of discover can they discover anything displeasing <laughs> can let's, let's start off the city can a scientist a Newton a Bacon a fig and bacon sandwich no a Galileo and start away from that can you picture just listen right quick this is either too simplistic or too complex an Einstein can anybody just at that level it seems to be the hard sciences can they discover something that's displeasing to them well, you can laugh real quick or you can laugh in a few minutes can you picture this is not really a trick question it's just from another cosmos can you imagine any mathematician theoretical physicist somebody sitting around and they come up with a new law or a new theory to start with the laws of thermodynamics first law of motion and for a Newton or anybody to, to as they would put it in the city to discover the law to realize aha the eureka moment aha and they discover something and go oh god that's terrible <laughs> I'll answer it for you well maybe I shouldn't yet can you conceive of that this is not a trick question it's not that far to look is it possible that a man discovered a new equation a new prime number a new way to arrive at prime numbers and he discovered it and it's displeasing like oh god <laughs> let's go into areas that would not seem to be that materialistic have you ever or can you imagine but have you ever heard of those in the non-hard sciences like in the religious areas the prophets those who have received enlightenment that heard the voice of the gods that went to these stages they come back and call it enlightenment and they came back so hey I've seen the truth I've seen the cosmic truth and boy I don't like it never 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 I'll go ahead and answer it for you the question that I propose I'll go ahead and answer it is not possible well I like my questions better let me ask the question again is it possible for anybody to truly now discover something that they find displeasing is that possible go ahead and think about it again is it possible for a Freud not an attack on Freud any more than religions but for the man that you all know him the father of psychiatry analysis modern psychology even to begin to theorize study these statistics these cases do what it is a soft version of an Einstein come up with theories having to do with the nature of the human psyche the, the idea of the conscious and the unconscious mind for it to come to the guy assuming there he was sitting up late at night and swinging a cigar and it suddenly struck him that kind of thing that ah and then he went yeah but ooh I don't like that <laughs> is it possible <clears throat> now can you see an impossible connection between that that conclusive statements the need for eternal inconclusive statements the need that there be a dichotomy an apparent observable felt difference between what people think and then what people say 
Well, I for one don't see any possible connection. Good, good, good. Because what if you discovered some connection and you didn't like it? Since we're running low on tape, let me go ahead and point out, besides my nodding and my hinting, at city level, under all ordinary conditions, life does not arrange itself through man to where anyone, all the way from the hard sciences to apparent religious or philosophical or psychological theorems, insights, things are not arranged to where men discover something, their own insight, that in any way that they later, a second later, a month later, that they find displeasing. It is not possible. It's not possible. Now, I gave you time to think about it. As silly and dumb as you may have thought it was when we started, it is not possible. Nobody has ever discovered anything that they found displeasing. That is, that they wish, hey, I wish I hadn't discovered this. I wish I had not seen this. Of course, it's life. Put it coming out in man, I'm saying it does not happen. Now let's look at another way. Since we're this deep into the nervous system and down in the mind shaft, can you try and reach into a mind shaft and not only turn it inside out, but upside down? If that's possible, do you get any hint, a new possible peak, as to why it is that some of what I say seems so blatantly obvious to you at times, and then you realize that it's almost not true, you almost can't remember it, and you absolutely realize that this can't be transferred hardly outside this room. When I say the ordinary people couldn't hear it, it's not an attack on them, you just realize, no, they couldn't. But why? If it's this true, why couldn't they hear it? Do you realize part of the beauty of the way life has arranged itself? That those things that humans would find displeasing, they can't discover. For me to point out that you won't believe anything you don't like, a lot of you got off on some good pathways on your own, which I was hoping for with that. And then we point out that you can't even believe somebody you don't like, which is a variation of the same thing. But do you get any hint that life is arranged in such a way that the things that would displease you, an ordinary person, nobody can discover? And of course, then part of life's more perverse fun is turning out people like me periodically that can see it and then think, well, maybe I'll tell somebody. It is so funny. <laughs> or if you want it in a cynical way, it's funny on the basis of taking your car in to be repaired again. That when, they come back, when they come back and tell you what they have to say, you might as well laugh. <laughs> but you cannot discover that at any ordinary level which you would find displeasing. And what is it that would be displeasing? But thus far, nobody here, in any way tied to my activity, has ever seen something on their own that you wish, boy, I wish I hadn't seen that. Now things are arranged, as I keep hinting, not to make you feel bad, but trying to get you to see, things seem to be arranged through some peculiar set of circumstances that things you see that are extraordinary, things you discover, you almost forget as soon as you discover them. It's real hard to remember them. And if you do, it's real hard to remember anything other than the speech of it. Real hard. It's like you get a glimpse of something and then somebody slaps you in the head and you almost forgot it. The part that forgot would have found it displeasing. If too many people saw it, life would find it displeasing. And then people that may hear something like this from me, from somebody like me at some other time, they can find it all the way from being curious to being dangerous but they can't ever explain why. It's just under certain circumstances. I'm not talking about me and martyrdom or any of that kind of shit. But throughout history, it's been, if it goes too far in a certain way, life then gets part of its own self to turn itself and say, 
Shut that stuff up. And people don't know why. It's just, we should, there's some things we shouldn't fool around with. There's some things that we shouldn't see. They don't know what it is. It's life thing. You know, that's enough of that. And we got to keep our balance. It's like under right conditions, perhaps a glass of wine now and then might be all right, or the party. But Jesus, you don't have to become an alcoholic, right? Don't you, dis- you don't want to discover things that you'd find displeasing because that would upset one of the rules I just pointed out to you that people do not discover things that are displeasing. As I said, if you didn't follow, if you can turn that inside out and upside down, notice why it's so hard to see any of this. Why it's so hard to hear it. Why at times it sounds just obvious as hell and then it sounds oblique as hell. And why? I got something to say after the public. So that's the end of the public meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Two people out of town, right quick. I already did this down here in Atlanta, but you should know about it. It was a season coming back up again, a rerun that I got of newer people. Some of you have written me from out of town, California, New York, and it happens here that eventually people who come into this, newer type people, find themselves to be periodically fascinated, struck with wonder at the beauty, the charm, the wit, the intelligence of the older people here. And then it leads from there to some other time to grave disappointment. And people want to point out to me, they want to whine about it, they can put it in uh, all sorts of attempted context. But it's like they're so disappointed. I cannot stop the people around here, no matter how long they've been here, from being human. And you newer people, as long as you got to go through that yourself, I can't really, in a profitable manner, stop you from being initially fascinated with people here, although I've tried to tell everybody new in some way, don't be fascinated with people here, don't be fascinated with me, just try and ignore all that kind of stuff. And try to tell you not to be disappointing each other. But then I've tried to also keep the kind of potential areas of most immediate and extreme mechanical disappointment one another, I've tried to keep them at a minimum. I've told you I want to allow hostility, overt hostility between you people. I want to just unbridled sexual flirting around, which is, a, say the least, a swampy breeding ground for hostility. But all these other little things that you disappoint each other. If you're going to deal with each other on some basis, some of the stuff you have to do because I tell you to do it, even in the other cities to go out and do things that I tell you to do, but the rest of it. If some of you go in business or if you're just doing social things together, you should at least try and do this. I can demand this much is treat each other in the same way that you'd treat me. If we agreed to meet somewhere at a certain time or if you asked me to do something for you and I agreed to do it or vice versa, that you would do it if it was possible. You got to treat each other that same way, not for any spiritual reason. You just got to do it. If for no other reason, then whenever I say that you got to do it, if I find out something's going on you're not doing it, I'll just throw you out so you can look at it as being the reason. But there should be a minimal amount of ordinary conflict and irritation or abrasion between all of you. And if nothing else, keep down your personal intercourse to the minimal level. Just do it. But if you do have to have some relationship with one another, be dependable, let your word have mean something, and treat each other as seriously. And whatever little commitment you make, treat each other as seriously as you would with me. That should cover it. If it doesn't, I'll come kick ass. I've been seeing too much of George Bush on TV, I think. <laughs> I'll be all right. I'll be all right. Maybe finally this will be the year that the anarchist party takes over Washington. Uh, no thanks. If nominated, I will not accept. If shot, I will not die. No. An excursion. St. Quantum's Day is Saturday, the 24th of September. For those of you out of town that need to know that. I don't know why you need to know that, but... The excursion is this. 
from Monday night, you recall I was talking about the duos in life that are subject to a deep wired, continual longing, no matter how much you see it manifest, but I gave you some prime examples, that the duos in life, not capital and labor, there's this continual drive to apparently produce a third area that serves as a kind of buffer, a kind of structure, unions, that apparently that there are three things when we start talking about that area of economics, that area of human life, that there's capital, there's labor, but now, in most parts of the world, there's the third, the union. And I point out to you, it's not. The union's not a separate thing. Or that if we take religion, you remember, man seems to be man, and then these great forces, erstwhile known as God, or the gods. There is a great dichotomy, but then there seems to be a third one gets produced, religion, some intermediary. It's a separate thing, and if not, it's for the protection of the more complex member of the party. It's a structure. It's a connection. It's not another entity. But all duos have the inbred, the inwired desire, the longing, the search for a potentially, a potential third area buffer. All right. That's all on Monday night's tape. The excursion that we ran to take for Monday, I'm going to give you now, as I wanted you people on your own. What other, just look around, they're everywhere. Duos in life, can you see, that has produced, or seeks, seems to seek, seems to be attempting to produce a third area. Not just the king, the monarch, the single source of power, and then all the people, the bureaucracy, the court, nobility, but there seems to be a third area. So it's not just this direct abrasion, it's not this face-to-face -face conflict or confrontation between the state and the people, the king and the people, capital and labor. There seems to be a third area, and if for nothing else, it's like the more powerful can always shift some of the blame over there. But it seems to be a buffer and it primarily seems, from most observations, at city level, to be for the benefit of the least powerful. That the unions are for the benefit of labor, right? And it's not right. It's for the benefit of capital. It's for the benefit of the situation. It's for the benefit of the dance. It's only for the benefit of life. But even at a level that is distracting, that is misdirection in action, you can see that just at city level, that unions seem to be, without any doubt, for the benefit of labor. They're not. They're for the benefit of capital. Or that religion seem to be for the benefit of man. To help him get in contact with the gods. Or for some of us, for the benefit of man, right? No. It's for the benefit of God. That the court, the bureaucracy, it's for the benefit of the people. Because all people can't get to the king, or to the president, or the prime minister. So the bureaucracy is to kind of spread out the power and to help the people. So they can have more access, more potential access, to the seat of power, right? Wrong. It's for the benefit of the powerful. It's for the benefit of the government, of the king. See, just look around at the duos going on in life. They just, you know all that. Good and bad, right and wrong, up and down, everywhere. Republicans and Democrats, good people and bad people. That there is this continual urge. It comes out sometimes and it seems to recede, but it's always there. <coughs> that there's this longing, if not an overt manifestation that you can readily identify through speech. There is this longing between the two dancers for the apparent production of a third area that serves as a buffer between the two. One minute, or one finger. See! what you can locate on your own. See what you can discover on your own. <coughs> Always like, leave them laughing. I was going to tell you what a comedian is. I'll tell you some night. Always like the ones that you hear on these announcers. Like a news show, just on Sunday. The guy will sign off and say, well, that's all the news for this Sunday. And it's a, uh, until next time, this is Fred Schwartz. <laughs>
and you wonder, until next time, I'm so-and-so. You know, I, I keep playing, and, and, you know, what's the rest of it? <laughs> until next Sunday, I'm so-and-so. And after that, you know, well, to what might we look forward?